so as um, Richard has said, uh, I'm doing this workshop um, on basically photographing Lego models better. I mean, this is about, I guess you're all interested in, in trains in particular. There's nothing much about this presentation that's particularly about trains apart from a bit later on. Um, let me just, I find it's quite strange. I thought there'd be a few people that I could uh, want to talk to, but <laughs> no faces at all. So um, I'm just going to put this, actually that's not the, so here's the first page. So I'm just, I'm just trying to get the Zoom thing out of the way so I can see my presentation. Okay, so um, I, uh, yeah, as Richard said, I, I'm a Lego artist now. I got back into Lego about um, 2012, 2000, 2013. Um, and the 10 years before that, I was a professional architectural photographer. So I worked freelance photographing buildings um, and Lego was a bit of a, what I thought might be an interesting sideline really as well as photographing buildings, building them out of Lego. Uh, and for a few years, it kind of ran alongside really just as a hobby and doing the occasional commission. Um, and then about 2015 or 16, it became, it just took over from the photography for me. So I haven't practiced as a photographer for three or four years now. Um, and it's all been about the Lego, but you know, I'm obviously here today doing this from the, from the photography point of view um oh, this is bringing it yeah so i'm a, so i'm a, i'm also got a fellowship from the professional the british institute of professional photography so that was um you know i did take photography quite seriously for a while and i didn't think i'd ever move on from it but um it's funny how things work out so um just a little example of the kind of photography i used to do uh, and and how it's moved on to my company which is brick this and I'll just give you a few little examples of, of what I do before I move on to the proper presentation. So most of what I do is architectural stuff. Um, this is Bose Museum, which is uh, an amazing museum art gallery up in County Durham. 40,000 Lego pieces in that one. And then Annick Garden, um, another lo local one for me, which I completed last year with Richard's help, I should say. And then this is, um, so the, the train side of it was a, and I have to confess, I'm not a massive um, train fan as such. Um, the, the Lego side of it just happened by accident, really. A couple of the early commissions I got were trains. So this is a one tenth scale replica of the Tiny Wear Metro, which I did a few years ago. And then the following year, a similar project, one tenth scale of a Grand Central train um about 20 30,000 bricks in each one of these uh and then the rocket which um the one on the right here is the one i've got on lego ideas at the moment but i've also done a much bigger one that's on display in newcastle at the moment of the rocket so i've got a bit of an obsession with the rocket having done a few versions of it um so i've done quite a few trains but most of what i do is architecture uh and, so, and obviously the photography was was a, a the fact that I've been a photographer for 10 years really helped, I think, establish my business in the first place because it meant that I, the work I was, the pictures that I was putting on social media and Instagram in particular, um, did uh, showed off the work, the, the Lego work quite well. Uh, also means I've got quite a bit of kit that's useful for that. Um, but as it says on this slide here, the, the light, as, as a photographer, it was all about available light for me. It was architectural work. So I was outdoors. Some, well, some interiors, but even if it was interiors, it was the lighting that was there in the space. So the whole lighting side of it has been a bit of a learning curve for me over the past few years. So uh, what we're going to do today, um, I just wanted to go through uh, first of all, example of what, what a bad photograph is. And don't worry, I've not picked anybody's. I've um, taken one of my own to show. Um, and then I'm basically going to go through, starting at a very basic level, what can you do for very little effort and money to make take better pictures and then move on to slightly more advanced setups and then finishing with what's behind me which is by no means the most expensive or advanced setup you could get but it's what I've got and it does for me um so that includes lighting equipment and stuff uh I'm going to talk a little bit about specific things around photographing trains as well and a little bit about SLR cameras 
and some of the settings and how to use them. And if I've got time, I'll do a little bit on Photoshop, but you could do a 10 week course on Photoshop alone. So I'd, I don't know if that will get a little bit <laughs> technical perhaps, but just a couple of little pointers. So, okay, so what makes a bad photograph? So I've taken this shot the other day in my dining room of um, the, the International Space Station model, which some of you might have. I'm just checking, I haven't got anybody in the waiting room, have I? No. So uh, th this, most of what I'm gonna talk about today uh, is a phone would be just as good as a SLR camera. So this, I, I took this with my phone. Um, this is a bad photograph in my eyes. <laughs> if this looks familiar to anybody in terms of what they take, then hopefully you'll get something from today. Okay, well, I've got someone in the waiting room. Admit. Uh, so what, what is the problem with this photograph? Well, for me, the big problem with this photograph is flash. So a lot of people, when they're taking pictures on their phone, the, the flash will automatically come on. A flash can give a really harsh look to a picture. With Lego, I think it can be particularly bad because Lego is quite a shiny um, material. Uh, so that, that to me looks like someone has just held the phone up, taken a picture, and that's it. No thought gone into the composition, so it's at a funny angle. You've got the picture in the background that doesn't add anything to it. If you're getting really picky, you actually can't tell on the shot, but it's a bit dusty. So um, that's a, a general point for when you're setting these things up. If you're photographing something that's been on your shelves for a while, uh, give it a good dust. Um, as well as, you know, I look at that and it doesn't look like it's very symmetrical and things aren't all rotated the same way. So all in all, not a great shot, but the big, the key thing there is, is the flash. So what I've got on the next page, if I can move to that, why is it not moving? There we go. So two shots here, little train model that some of you might have, I think it was a freebie with if you spent a certain amount on Lego. Um, so I'm not, I've just noticed that I've fallen into one of my traps there. It's not been dusted, but never mind that. So what I've done here, these are in a different league to each other as far as I'm concerned as a photograph. Um, the one on the right, I've just taken, it flashes on again. I've not cleared the table or anything. One on the left, nice clean background. So you might think, look at that and think, oh, that's quite a lot of work. But there's almost no work involved in that whatsoever. And I'll show you what the setup is. That's the setup in my studio. It's a bit of white card taped to the wall. Uh, you get a nice bit of curvature there. I've turned the flash off and I've still taken it with the phone and I've just held it there and taken the shot. So, you know, if you want a, a really cheap and quick way of getting better fit, and oh, this is a small model. I appreciate if you've got a much bigger model then, then there might be more setup involved, but the, the principle is the same. Um, bit of white card hardly costs anything um you know in a few minutes to set it up and if you get it right in the camera if you get the so it's not a funny angle and you've dusted it and you've got all the pieces pressed together properly um then you can take a shot from your phone and use it straight away and if you're using stuff mostly on social media the quality is going to be absolutely fine so um and obviously you don't have to use a white card you can have a different effect if you use different colored cards, you get all sorts of different colored cards to put behind there. So the kind of isn't really an excuse <laughs> for not doing that. Um, and I think with a competition like this, obviously it's not a photography competition this. So in theory, I presume, you wouldn't be marked down with bad pictures, but this is about getting your, as with anything, getting your product noticed. And I think you're trying to catch the eye of the judges. So, um, a better photograph is going to help do that and it's going to show that you are taking you've obviously spent quite a lot of time on the model so a, a shot that takes five seconds to do and doesn't look very professional at all i think is, isn't going to help you and of course if it came down to a couple of models that were equally as good then you probably well you're not doing yourself any favors i think by having by having bad pictures um so let's go on from that so that that was a very basic setup um, which pretty much anyone could do. The next step for me was um, a few years ago, I bought this light box. So you've, you've perhaps seen these. Um, they give you a bit more control of lighting. There's some little LED 
um, lights that you can angle inside that and the, and the front flops down so you can see, so you can block off any exterior light. Um, you get different colored card that sort of slots into it. So that's a picture I've taken in there. You can get bigger. The problem with this for me is it's not very big and most of the models I do are, are, are far too big to fit in something like this. Um, you can get bigger ones, but by the time, if you've got, you might as well have a setup like I've got behind me if you've got really big models. Um, they cost about 40 quid though. You can pay more, but about 40 quid. So again, not a massive investment. Um, and if you just search on Amazon, you'll, you'll find something like that. And they have, um, I might show you if we've got time later, you can, you can dim the lights on these and you can angle them. Because again, you've got the, an issue with Lego that it's quite shiny. You need to kind of, you need to watch for that if you're using lighting. Right. And then a slightly more, well, the, the most advanced setup that I've got, I've got nothing more than this really, um, is this, you can perhaps see it behind me. I've got a framework, which is shown on the slide. Sorry, I'm, you won't be able to see what's behind me, will you? Because I'm sharing the presentation. <laughs> well, I've got me the screen on. So you've got a, um, a framework, which is basically a couple of, tri uh, sort of tripod um, stands with a bar across, and you can get uh, a piece of material that hangs down. This is a, basically a bigger version of the card taped to the wall. Um, they don't cost much. You can spend 40 quid and get something like that. I think that's all I paid for paid for that one and then some lighting um similar kind of thing they're 40 or 50 quid for a couple of lights and you, you can see bottom right um i've got an slr camera so the big the big cost here really is the camera um and the, and the tripod and stuff and i've obviously already i've had that kit for a long time um i don't think i can make a very convincing argument anymore for submit someone else i can't make a very convincing argument for going out and spending thousands of pounds on a digital camera when phone cameras are getting so good i will come on to that because there are some benefits and obviously you can get a load of different backdrops so i've got a black backdrop on the one behind me you can get all sorts of different effects um the one that's shown on the screen with the tractor is a sort of i only recently bought this it's not quite the look i wanted it's got a kind of especially a sort of stone effect you can get there's hundreds you can get out there so okay yeah so this slide this is the issue you know do you need to invest in a better camera if you haven't got i presume some of you have got digital slr cameras if you haven't um there, there probably isn't great justification for buying one um what they do allow you to do is take high resolution pictures um if you're mostly showing on social media, I don't think it makes a big difference nowadays, but if you want to print something or, um, you know, if you want, if you intend to use it for something other than social media, then you can get better resolution pictures. Um, the big thing for me with digital cameras is that you can, you can change um, shutter speed and aperture and all that kind of stuff. And again, that's something that you could do a whole course on alone. So I, I'm very aware that there'll be people at very different stages with their photography. So I don't, I don't want to go too far down that route, but I will show you on the next slide, I think a few little um, introduction things to photography. So photography uh, and using an SLR is all about controlling the light that gets into the camera. Okay. So, you'll probably all hopefully have heard of aperture and shutter speed and I and ISO and that kind of thing. Those three things sort of relate to each other. And what this handy chart shows you is, uh, so you know, the, you know the effect where if you take a picture and the background's really blurry, it's, it works really well with portrait photography often. You don't want all the background showing. Um, that is controlled by the aperture. So if you have a very, so, and that is literally how, much the, the the lens opens to let the light in if you have a very wide aperture letting lots of light in you get a very shallow depth of field and that means anything in the background of what anything you're not focusing on is likely to be out of focus and that's what's shown on the top level there the background is out of focus as your aperture gets smaller and smaller and smaller 
up to f32 that's a tiny aperture much more the scene is in focus to a limit if you had that person that's shown with the mountains behind if he was right up in your face then you wouldn't be able to get the right depth of field but generally speaking you get much more the shot of the of the subject matter in focus and then and i'll skip the middle one for now i'll go to the bottom one the iso is basically what used to be called uh, film speed it's how quickly the film reacted to the light the quicker it reacts on the right the grainier the picture would be and nowadays grain isn't really the right word with a digital camera but you still get a a, a, a sort of a tidier image i think with a smaller uh, with a with a much slower film speed and the slower film speed is right down to iso 50 or 100 and then the middle one is the shutter speed so it's how long the shutter is open for and that's where you might use it uh, you need a very fast shutter speed if you're trying to capture someone who's running around the slow shutter speed get, gives you that nice effect with trail lights of cars and things if you're doing that kind of photography now these things are important for photography because um what you generally want from a from a picture of a lego model i think is it all to be sharp and in focus it can be quite a nice effect if someone is out of focus and it, it's particularly relevant for trains that can be quite long but you generally want it to be in focus and sharp and that means if you're using an SLR, cam slr camera having a iso that's very low so iso 50 and a very small aperture to keep it pin sharp and if you do those two things it's not reacting very quickly to the light and it's not uh, letting much light in so the camera sets a very long shutter speed to counteract that so you might a lot of the shots i do will be a shutter speed of 30 seconds or something now you can't hold a camera for 30 you can't hold a camera for a quarter of a second and not have shake so you need a tripod uh, so once you've got a camera on a tripod and it's doing a 30 second exposure then that opens up some interesting options in terms of lighting uh which i've just i've just said all this from this slide actually um yeah i'll skip that one because i said that so here's here's the aperture issue this lego model i've got of the angel of the north on the left i've had a very wide aperture it's only got in focus the bit i focused on which is the left bit of the wing the rest is out of focus it's not a bad photograph that's quite a nice effect but I think for a Lego model, I tend to avoid that because I want it all to be shown. On the right is a very uh, small aperture, so it's sharp across the whole model, but that's required a much longer exposure of a few seconds, probably. I hope this is making sense. <laughs> I never studied photography officially. I was all self-taught. And um, so <laughs> I don't know if that helps or not when it's trying to explain it to other people. Um, so if you're doing a, a shot for 30 seconds, you can really control the lighting. Now, having just talked about all the lighting equipment I've got behind me in the light box, I actually rarely use it because I find it, it can be quite a harsh look, even a soft light. Um, and with, Le with Lego, it's very shiny. And I, I think that shininess, if done well, can, can work, but often doesn't. So I tend to have a setup where i don't use these big lights you can see me on the i presume you've all got two versions of me haven't you or one version of me and the and the presentation <laughs> i hope so so i'm showing on the other screen these big lights that i've got here which are nearly knocked over i don't use them very much because um i tend to use the light that's available in the room with a long exposure and what you can start doing then is uh, some interesting stuff with kind of painting with light. And all I mean by that is that you can get, if you've got a model, right, let's see if this works. So if, if you're now watching the screen, is this working? <laughs> right, let's see. Hold on a minute. That's the wrong way around. Oh, no, this is confusing me too much because I don't know what screen to look at. So behind me, I've got the Lego model of the um, of the rocket. And if I was trying to photograph this and there wasn't 
and it was looking too dark on one side, you could light that with, a, with some lighting gear. I tend to avoid doing that and I will get uh, a piece of white card or something, something like this, and just hold it up and reflect the light onto it. And over a 30 second exposure, that will make a difference. And you won't get it right first time. So a lot of this is about trying a few times. You put the camera on, 30 second exposure, maybe or 10 seconds or whatever it whatever it works. That's the point about an SLI. It will tell you what the exposure should be if you've set your aperture right and your ISO. And then you can just sort of stand around and hold a reflective bit of tin foil or something or a bit of white card and just put the light where you want it. Um, and experiment with that. There's no, I mean, this, this is slightly more advanced stuff, I guess. So it's not about getting it right in 10 seconds, which the earlier stuff was really about, a very quick way of doing it. If you really want to get the best out of your models, then experimenting with where the light is coming from, the quality of that light, um, and you'll, you'll notice some really different uh, effects. So on this next slide, I, don't, I actually don't like either of these pictures I've decided. <laughs> And it's quite a, a, a strange look, that backdrop. But the difference between these two pictures is the one on the left has used the lighting, um, and it's probably a couple of second exposure. The one on the right, no, no, none of those lights on, but a much longer exposure of 20 or 30 seconds. I'm not actually sure which one I prefer, because um, I don't like the backdrop. But there's a slight shininess to the one on, on the left that um, I wasn't sure I quite liked, but I'm not sure now. This is the point about photography. You can get very, very different effects from quite small changes. Um, and if you want to go down this route, then you'll find yourself trying all sorts of different ways of um, of getting the right effect and showing off your, your models. Right. Um, how are we doing for time? So a little bit about trains. <clears throat> um, obviously, what I've talked about so far applies to pretty much any Lego bowl. It applies, applies to a lot of uh, just studio photography in general. Um, the thing about trains is they're, all, they're often quite long. Um, and this poses some problems, not just with photographing them, but with showing them on social media. So if you take Instagram, for example, showing a very long train on Instagram is, is very, very difficult to do. Um, the principles are the same uh, if you wanted to do a, a, a side on picture of a long train. I've, put, I've picked a picture here from last year's entries, um, which is one of the solutions for this kind of scale is to curve it round a bit. And you'll notice here that what's happened is the back of it is very much out of focus. That isn't a criticism at all. Um, that's what happens. You could you could uh, change that by having a much smaller aperture and having the setup I've been talking about and make sure that much more of it is in focus. I don't think it matters for this one because um, it's quite a repetitive model. So you're not missing out on anything, I don't think. And it's quite a nice effect. What you've got to watch for with that is that you focus on the right bit. So if, you, if this was done with a phone, which it may well have been, and you'd focused on the middle of that train, then the front of it would be out of focus and that wouldn't look quite look right, but this one's been done well. Um, so that's one option with um, with how to photograph tra trains. Um, the, uh, the other option is um, with a long one, <laughs> in terms of displaying it, I think is, uh, and this is moving a little bit away from the competition, I guess, but uh, if you're looking to put it on social media is to, um, is to is to cut the picture up into sort of four sections so you can make a nice square of them. Um, that's getting more into kind of presenting on Instagram and things, I guess. Uh, everything I've talked about so far has been about showing your pictures uh, with a nice, showing your models with a nice clean background, which isn't the only way of doing it, of course. Um, so one of the things, and um, some of the categories for this competition, of course, are about sort of uh, bigger layouts um there's no there's nothing particularly different about that you've got you, they're probably a lot less uh, maneuverable so you might have to um work around the model rather than moving the model to a studio setup um it can be a really nice way of showing off 
<clears throat> the model just there's a couple of things to watch for one is that you're focusing on the right part of it if you're focusing if the camera is accidentally focused on the foreground and the train is actually a little bit out of focus then that doesn't look great as a photograph um and think about the cropping as well uh, so this one I, I did pick this from the competition last year <laughs> I, hope, I hope i'm not offending anyone who if, <laughs> if whoever did this is on this or is on this workshop so what i thought was with this was you need to think about the cropping there's an awful lot of what i think is wasted space really in in that in the photograph on the top that was the one that's entered i just cropped it down to show you just to think about the, the cropping a little bit of your pictures um it's about the train so make sure that's the focus of it um don't be afraid to crop down quite a lot in some cases um and make sure that it's it's level and that kind of thing. Right. I've completely lost track of the time. I can't even see a clock. Um, I think we're doing OK. So. I hope that's made. Thanks, Richard, for messaging me the time. I hope that's made some sense. Um, if that feels like a very, very fast <laughs> introduction and covered a lot. I was going to talk a little bit about Photoshop. Um, I'll spend five minutes on this because if you don't know Photoshop, then this is going to be absolutely over your head, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, so the thing about Photoshop is that it allows you to um, obviously edit your pictures to death if you want to. Uh, the, I'm going to focus on one thing here, which is really important for me, which is <clears throat> And I might actually switch to Photoshop to show you this. So this this is the photograph of the the Stevenson's rocket. I've got on Lego Ideas. A, if you can see bottom right, I've got something called layers. In fact, I am going to try. I hope this doesn't mess everything up. Uh, I want to. I should have opened this before. I'm not even sure what screen you can see now. Hoping it's just right. Let me go to oh, got it. right. Right, I just got Photoshop opening. While I'm doing that, can you all still see my presentation? Need to reshare my screen. Someone's saying, okay. Bear with me. Uh, right, can people see a red background behind? No, you can't because I can see what's on there. Right, I'm just going to do a new share. Ah, I think that might be it. So I can see a couple of people. Can you nod your heads if you can see a red background? <laughs> okay, so this here on the right in Photoshop, I've got, I'm going to turn some of these off. That little eye turns it off. That's the original picture taken on a bookshelf. What I've done here is I've copied, I've, I've put a layer, a couple of, I'm going to turn that red one off, put a gray layer on top of it. If you imagine literally putting a piece of gray paper on top of a picture, all you see is the gray paper, the, the picture's underneath. And then the top layer, I have got another copy of the picture. Forget, you don't need the bottom one actually, that's just there because in case you make a mistake. So the top layer has what's called a layer mask. And this allows me to cut out around the picture to show what's underneath. So what is underneath at the moment, ignore the red layer. What is underneath is the gray layer. So if I use an erase brush, it gets rid of, I don't know why it's only doing it a little bit. It gets rid of there and it shows what's underneath. If you go wrong, wrong bit. It's not playing ball. Anyway, if you go wrong, you can paint it back in so it's still there. So all you've done is you've cut out, um, and that's quite complicated. You could spend the whole course on how to cut out. It can be time consuming. You can have, sometimes have to do it manually. 
But the point is, once you've done it, you can put whatever background behind you want. You can switch those out around really easily because you d and you don't have to reselect it. So for for most of the pictures I take, even if I've got the big setup behind me and I've done all that, I'd probably still do this stage because if I decide that I don't want it with a grey background, I can easily change it. And if I paint that, if I pick a, if I pick white and colour that, it puts a white background behind, and it's not touching the the picture of the model because that's on the next layer. You're just dealing with um, the, la the layer underneath. So I think imagining it as literally layers of pictures. So the top layer is now a cut out version of the rocket. Underneath that is a white layer. There's a gray layer underneath that, but it's irrelevant because you can't see it. But if I turn off the white layer, then you can see it. So what I do for most of my pictures, I'll have a file like this, I'll save it. And, and if I want to output it to um, as a JPEG, you can't say this isn't a JPEG file. You can't save it as a JPEG. But if I do, to put it on Instagram or something, I'll, I'll flatten it. Uh, that's the process called flattening it and I'll save it and use it for whatever I need to but I will keep this file like this as a kind of source file so if I ever think actually this would look nice with a black background or a, I don't know, a grayed out a black and white faded version of that picture for some weird effect then you can put it in there very easily without having to select the whole model again which can be time consuming so I'm going to leave it there for Photoshop because like I say I, I could go on um you could you could do a huge amount of Photoshop, but if anyone if any of you are at the Photoshop stage and you're thinking of about um, putting different backgrounds in and that kind of thing, then that's a useful way of looking at it. That layered approach, right? And then I'm just going to see if I can go back to my yeah. I think we're back on the no, we're not. That's annoying. I think I have to do a new share every time I change the program I'm using. Right, so we're back here. And all I'm doing here is finishing off with a few examples. <coughs> I by no means think of myself as an absolute expert in this. I'm still learning about lighting models all the time. And I just wanted to give you some inspiration for some other people on Instagram. You may already know about these guys. I think they're all guys, don't know that actually, um, who are absolutely brilliant when it comes to lighting the models um to check them out there's there's loads more i couldn't remember all the names when i was putting this together but they're three of my favorites and amazing models as well but that's kind of almost beside the point actually <laughs> it really helps them stand out right i'm gonna i'm gonna stop there because <clears throat> i know we've got less time for questions so i'm going to now Put you back to Richard. Is that a sensible thing to yeah, do? Yeah, that's, that's probably a good idea. Yeah. Um, so I need to find you and make host. <clears throat> okay. So Richard's in is back on now. Yeah. So um, thank you very much, Steve. That was uh, really informative, and um, I think a lot of people. There were quite a few questions there. Um, in chat as well and a couple of comments okay. we can read those out but um yeah i think that was really interesting and from the looks of it other people have found it pretty helpful too i hope so um, so thank you very much for doing that um one of the questions which i think was by doug a little bit further up it was earlier in the talk let me see if i can find that in the chat yeah here we go so uh wide angle lenses tend to distort the image so what focal length do you recommend right um I don't use wide angle lenses for exactly that reason. Um, the, the, every wide angle lens will have a focal length which is not getting barrel distortion, usually in the middle somewhere. Um, so, uh, you know, if you've got an 18 to 40, uh, probably, let's say you've got 18 to 40, you'll get barrel distortion at 18 and 40, but somewhere in the middle, less, much less so. I, I use some fixed length lenses and being an architectural photographer, I use these tilt shift lenses, which is a whole another, which allow you to, they do some very funny things and it's about that they're for architectural, but they're fixed length. They don't need to be the, these tilt shift lenses, but a fixed length lens, and you can get wide angle fixed length lens that don't zoom in and out that will have no barrel distortion because they're only at one focal length. The problem is they're very expensive. So generally try and keep in the middle, but you can change barrel distortion 
um, in Photoshop. You can probably do it on phones now, but there is options to distort, to remove that in Photoshop. Um, that might be something for, if we ever do something like this again, I could perhaps look at that. I hope that answers it. Yep, I think, um, yes. If not, just, just ask me to, to expand. Uh, there's, so there was a little bit of discussion about um, Photoshop alternatives as well, because Photoshop is pretty expensive. Um, yeah. I pay for a license. Um, a couple of people have suggested GIMP, and it has pretty similar features. Uh, right. I think there's also an app called Sketch, um, which I remember being free and um, some graphic design friends of mine seem to seem to really like. Um, I'm sure there are alternatives, but GIMP would be a pretty good option if you're on a budget and you, you just want something yeah. to do that. That's um, a good point. I've, I've only ever used Photoshop, but yeah, I'm sure there's others. I think um, somebody had said there are plenty of um, tutorials on YouTube as well for, well, probably for Photoshop and for GIMP. So you'll be able to find um find a way of doing it hopefully um i have a question from max which is is there anything i can do to control exposure time depth of field or anything at all if i'm using an iphone yes um i used to have an app that was called slow shutter speed or something um i i think i think if people have got samsung phones i don't think iphones are the best in terms of cameras on phones at the moment I know uh, Samsung are pretty good, but there are apps you can get. Um, they might cost a couple of quid, but I did have a slow shutter speed one once. Um, that was, it was more about sort of capturing blurry movement, um, but it, and I, I don't know if you can, I don't know what you can do on Aperture. I think you can, I think you can do things clever. In fact, I'm not sure you, I think even in Instagram, you can change things to do with, um, throwing the background out of focus and stuff. Uh, I might be wrong there, but there are, have a look for some apps um, that allow you to control that, that kind of thing. Um, and this is what I was saying earlier. I, I, the reasons for getting a digital SLR camera are getting less and less, I think. There's still a thing about the fact that the size of the glass in it and the quality of the glass is really important and they'll only ever get so good, I think, in a, in a camera. But, um, Yes, you can you can certainly get apps that control for shutter speed. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Uh, a couple Sorry, of can I just add something to that? Yeah. Um, you'll need a tripod, um, and you can get some very cool little tripods. I, I think I had one once called a Gorilla Pod or something that you can attach an iPhone to, because you won't be able to handhold it if you've got a longer shutter speed. Thank you. Um, we had a couple of recommendations for Samsung phones and Huawei phones and Sony as well. Um, Doug yeah. had a question which was, is it easier to cut out the image with a different color backdrop, uh, e.g. green screen? Yes, um, this is a really good question actually. Um, cu cutting, cutting out a model is what I've probably spent more time on that I've not wanted to spend time on than anything else. Um, it depends on the color of the model. So uh, if you've got some, a model with a lot of white in it, then have a black background will be easier to cut out. Um, I remember with the rocket trying to photograph that, uh, I had a white background, but then it became quite difficult to cut out the, around the um, chimney because that's white. Um, there's poss possibly some argument in having a completely different color, like a green background or something like a green screen. The problem then is, you sometimes get a little fringe of that color where you've right up at the edge of the model. And that can be, there's, like I say, you could spend weeks talking about, about, about this. You can, the different ways of selecting backgrounds is, is vast in Photoshop. So I tend to avoid bright colors like that. I tend to pick a color that is pretty neutral so that if there's, a little bit of it creeping in after you cut it out it doesn't matter quite so much but it a lot of it depends on the the color of the model okay thank you uh we had a question from ben what about dslr versus mirrorless digital mirrorless digital i don't even know what that is 
Does he mean um, like a medium format camera? Uh, I guess we'll find out in a second. <laughs> mirrorless. Oh. Uh, mirrorless camera like Canon M50. I don't know about that. Um, I, as a photographer, I, I always hated doing, I did a lot of talks about photography at camera clubs and I hated questions about kit because I was never into the kit. It was just a tool for me to get the pictures. Um, I had This does ring a bell. So this is where you don't have the mirror that flips up to let the light the light in. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I can't answer that because I don't really know about them. <laughs> no problem. Uh, we have an, another question from Max. So um, if I am lighting a model using daylight from a window, any suggestions for the time of day or model um, or position of the sun, etc. Mm. Whatever I do, I end up casting a shadow over my model. Right. Uh, good question as well. I actually ended up taking some pictures of my rocket out outside last year. At one point, um, the the best thing for that bright sunlight is awful. It will give you awful shadows. So if you're totally outside, so a, a, a grey day is quite good for getting even light over a model. It would apply inside as well. I would say. Um, what can work quite well? We, I had a room that had a, a sort of white blind, um, material blind that on a bright day still let through a decent amount of light and kind of diffused it a bit. Um, you certainly don't want the light shining straight in. So it, it, uh, there's, there's lots of factors that come into play there. Um, it's about that diffuse light, I think. Um, not having it shine directly on it. So e so maybe even hold up, like if you've got a sheet, a bed sheet, a white bed sheet that you could hold up in front of the window just to diffuse the light. The other thing is not having the back. So that example I had with the white card taped up on the wall, if you had the model right up against the card, you might still get some shadow. Try and bring the model forward from whatever background you've got there and diffuse the light as, as much as you can. What you might find then, of course, is you, there isn't much light in the room so that's where a tripod and a longer exposure might come in again that's one of the things that gives you that that control if you have got those things if you're just using a phone you could probably still just mount it on something um set the timer on the phone so it doesn't wobble when you press it i should have mentioned that earlier actually that's another technique um setting the timer on it and that that should that should address that I think I hope almost forgot what the question was <laughs> Did that... photographing in a room with with just daylight so was that that was about daylight coming in through the room not the light coming through the window not the light in the room I think so yeah because um, yes. once you start yeah. bringing in yeah I hope that helps ask follow it up if um if it doesn't um, do we have any more questions for Steve? Yes, that's that seems to have answered Max's question anyway. Thanks, Max. Uh, yep, there's a question here. Should I use the brightest light possible? Uh, I think Steve's possibly already answered that a little bit in that really bright sunlight doesn't work and Lego's quite shiny, but um, yeah. I'll let him um, pick that one up. Well, I think about bright, it could be. It could be a lovely effect on a, on a model outside. Depends what, it depends what you're going for. Um, I, with the lights I've got, um, I will often dim them down quite a lot um, because it can give quite a harsh look to the, the thing about the shininess of Lego is it's part of Lego. Some models really benefit from having a bit of um, glare on them. I, I took a picture of a model I did of the car from Greece <laughs> that has got some chrome bits on it where I did put flash, uh, well, some lighting on it because I wanted that look. Um, what you've got to be careful of if you put a lot of light on something also is it can wash out the colours a little bit. Yeah. Um, so no, it's, it's certainly not about as much light as you can get on it. Um, it's about controlling that light. I hope that helps. Yeah, I, I think I think that answered the question fairly well, didn't it? So, uh, any more questions for Steve, or are we ready to wrap up? We've got we've got a little bit of time if we need it. 
Uh, oh yeah, another question. So any tips for black leather in particular? And I imagine a lot of trains, yeah, a lot of trains are all black or mostly black. And it is, I think it's quite a hard color to photograph well in a Lego model. Yeah, it is. Um, well, get, getting the colors right, any color actually, you know, I'm a bit of a perfectionist with these things and I'll, that, well, that example I had before, wherever it's gone, the colors can look very different um, and not necessarily like the colors we expect them to look like. Um, black, you want you want it to look black, but it's not completely black. The same as white isn't completely white with Lego. Um, I think the, the thing about uh, black is making sure it picks up the dust massively. So it's particularly important to clean it. Um, and you, it will also pick up any slight differences in shading or if some of them are scratched. Um, and I think flash on black can be particularly uh, bad. Um, so that, that's where I would definitely try. If you've got a model that is predominantly black, I can't, I don't think I've ever done a model that's maybe a couple. Um, it's about uh, trying to minimize that glare off it. Um, so make sure you're doing it with a flash off, I would say. And the other thing you can do in Photoshop is you can tweak, you can tweak these if, I'm not sure it's relevant. If, if you can say this should be black in Photoshop, well, this should be white and you click on it and it will change the whole picture based on what you've told it is white. The problem with that is, as I said before, Lego, Lego white isn't, isn't white, it's slightly off white and the blacks, black but it's not deep 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 black um but you can perhaps play around in in uh, some photoshop or some other editing software and tweak it great thank you um we have another question from adam uh which is how would you photograph a large build something like a city style build that won't fit inside a light box yeah um well this is the problem i have with most of my models so that anic garden model i showed you at the start was that three by two meters um at one point i had you can see my ceiling behind me it's got sort of like um little panels that you can push up i had uh sheets hanging all the way around it to try and get a picture with a clean background because i wanted to cut it it had a lot of trees on the sort of skyline level and trying to cut that out in Photoshop with a messy background would have been almost, well, it would have taken days of work probably. Um, so that's one option, trying to put some kind of um, backdrop all the way around it. Um, and, you know, I've done it with hanging material from the ceiling. It doesn't have to be very fancy looking. Um, and that, and what you have to remember with big with big scenes is that you will probably have um, a lot of it that's out of focus, but that can work really well. So if you've got a train, say, and, and quite a big setup around it, and you're not just trying to show the train, you want to show the setup as well. If you focus on the train and the rest is a bit blurry around the outside, that can work really well. But if you want to do it so it's all sharp, then this is where your, your aperture issue comes in and a tripod and setting the ISO low and the aperture very small um but what can also work well you know to do it in one shot I, th I think really big layouts like that are difficult to do in one shot they're almost too much to look at i often find pictures of the details of, of these layouts much more interesting and they're often when i put stuff on social media and i've got a big layout um often and i put a few detail shots on as well it's often those that get more interest so uh, really have a look at zooming in on, or getting really close up to parts of it and trying to um, capture the details that way rather than rather than trying to get it all in one shot. C Richard, can you read that question out again? Did I? Yep. So we, we've actually had two fairly similar ones. So how would you photograph a large building, something like a city style build that won't fit inside a light box? And there's also... Wow. Uh, Ben has asked, what about two tall buildings that don't necessarily fit right. into the image frame? Yeah, I was thinking about um, sort of big flat model. So a big, so I've done a couple of really big models. Uh, Bose Museum was nearly two meters long and about a meter and a half high. Um, and well, 
Ar architecture is a, is a different... One of the things that comes into architectural builds is this um, converging verticals issue you get. So as soon as you point a camera up, anything off horizontal, and this is particularly relevant if you're photographing a tall model, you'll get it looking like it's leaning, tapering off to a point. Now that isn't necessarily, it's not wrong. People often expect that, and it's very difficult to get a picture of a real building, real skyscraper that doesn't do that. But one of the things, that, this tilt shift lens that I've got for, as an architectural photographer counters that, and it makes sure that all your verticals are vertical. So I think the important thing with buildings like that is to try and make sure that lines that should be straight up are straight up, and you don't necessarily need fancy equipment to do that. Just look out for it and particularly important to make sure it's it's not wonky at all. Um, they won't fit in a light box um, unless you buy a really big one. But you could, if you and if you've not got all the sort of tripod gear with hanging drapes and stuff, you can, even, I've done it where I've had someone hold a sheet behind the model and while I've taken a picture. Um, you know, there's quite cheap ways of doing it. I think that probably answers that. I hope it does. Uh, there's not, uh, let me think what I, so when I've done it, the other thing to watch for is that you can, you can with a very big building, if the light isn't even, you can get um, a look where it's sort of fading off one side or it's too bright on one side. So just look, watch out for that. that and it's all about controlling the light. So if you've got, um, I remember with the Bose Museum, when I was photographing that, there was a part that just looked a lot um, less bright than the rest. So I held up um, a reflective sheet just to get some extra light into it. Is that, is that okay? Yep, I think that's a, a pretty good answer. Some, I, I suppose sometimes the answer is there isn't really an answer. <laughs> there, isn't a, there isn't a good way to capture stuff. Um, it's certainly the case. There's not always an easy way of doing it. Um, you know, I, I when I do a big project, I've set aside a few days at the end of it to photograph it properly in different. You know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't photograph when it's dark outside in the studio usually, um, but I would sometimes come in to get some a different effect. Um, you could spend a lot of time on it. The model's taken a lot of time, so I put a lot of time in photography. But then I'm into photography as well, so um, there's no two ways around it. The more time you spend on it, thinking about it, the better the results will be. Great, thank you. Any last questions for um, for Steve? Um, Landy's just commented, if you are taking pictures of a large model, couldn't you use panorama mode on a phone? Uh, yes, you could. Um, I've never done it for a Lego model, but I certainly used it when I've been out and about just with the family and stuff and the joins can this may have come on and i'm sure it's one of those aspects of phone technology that that is it that is evolving pretty quick but i'd always notice the joins um that's a good that's a uh, if you did it if you held it very carefully and um yeah it might work um but it so okay so it sounds like the question originally was literally fitting it in the frame um if that's the case, <laughs> I would just stand further back. <laughs> I don't know if I'm quite addressing the issue here. <laughs> um, but we, the, you know, there might be a space a space issue there. If you're using a phone and you've got a big model in quite a small space, then you might not be able to fit it all in one go. And um, yeah, but you know, the the, solu the obvious solution there is to stand back to get more of it in. Um, I'd be interested to see if anyone has done any panoramic shots using that function to get um, shots of Lego models. They could work quite well. I don't remember seeing any last year. We might get some now. Now it's been suggested. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Um, okay, any last questions for Steve? You can just give people in, in chat a chance to catch up and type anything out they want to. Um, and then we'll bring it to... Uh, so it doesn't look like there are any more questions. So okay. uh, 
thanks again to Steve. That's been really interesting. And um, I think we've answered everybody's questions. Um, so uh, just a shout out, just to say thanks again to Steve from Brick This for the photography workshop. Um, entries for the Brick Train Awards open tomorrow, which is the 1st of February, um, although I probably won't get around to publishing this video on YouTube until about Tuesday, I'd imagine. Um, so that uh, other people who couldn't make this time slot uh, can can get some help. And um, yeah, thanks thanks very much, Steve. I think that was, um, You're welcome. was really good. Yeah. Thanks for asking me. It was fun.